Today I'm going to describe results from an experiment uh, that I did while I was on sabbatical in Ireland. So last year I spent sabbatical in Ireland, in Moore Park, Ireland, which is in Southern Ireland. And uh, we studied this question about glucose and, and its relevancy to postpartum cows. So that's uh, the farm that I worked on. Those are the cows that I worked with. Uh, admittedly, slightly different from your typical U.S. system, and that castle is from the 1300s, so slightly older than the United States of America. And those are the labs that I worked in. And so what's really great about Moore Park and working in Ireland is that the cows are very close to the laboratories, and every last little bit of green space is used for grazing, okay? So it's a fantastic place to do research. I worked in a place called Moore Park, which is a research unit associated with Chagas, which is a national research organization in Ireland. And the guy who organized the sabbatical was named Pat Dillon. He runs the organization. And I worked with a guy named Stephen Butler. And you can see I want to put this acknowledgments up front because the research I'm going to talk about really involved quite a lot of people. So I wanted to make sure I acknowledged all those people and particularly acknowledged uh, Pat Dillon and uh, Stephen Butler. And so the reason I'm really interested in glucose is the fact that uh, ruminants need quite, uh, dairy cows need quite a lot of glucose to do what they need to do. And the average uh, glucose requirement to produce one kilogram of milk is 72 grams of glucose. So 72 grams of glucose are required to produce one kilogram of milk. That means that the average Irish dairy cow will require two five-pound bags of glucose daily to produce that much milk. And if you think about the average U.S. dairy cow, it's probably more like three or four bags of glucose daily to produce that much milk. And what's so interesting about that problem is that they're ruminants, so they have to synthesize all this glucose in the liver because that not much glucose crosses... Uh, through the lower GI. So it's an interesting biological problem. If we look at data from Overton, uh, Tom Overton, what Tom suggested based on many studies was that the typical dairy cow is actually sufficient in terms of glucose supply before she calves. But then after calving, the typical dairy cow becomes deficient in terms of glucose supply relative to demand. And this deficiency is somewhere between uh, uh, half a kilogram and a kilogram per day. So they're not able to synthesize enough glucose in the liver to the meat to the demand. If we look at what happens postpartum, and these are data actually from Irish dairy cows. If we look at what happens postpartum, so this is, uh, these are blood glucose concentrations in Irish dairy cows. You can see there's a spike in glucose on the day of calving. That has to do with the glucocorticoid release that occurs at calving. And then there's a subsequent decrease in blood glucose during, the, during this early postpartum period. And the decrease in glucose is probably because of this increase in demand relative to supply. But the other thing that really caught my eye about this is if we look at a high fertility cow compared with a low fertility cow, what you see is that cows with better fertility have more blood glu circulating glucose concentrations during this early postpartum period compared with cows with low fertility. So that really got my interest. What is it about this first three to four weeks postpartum and blood, circulating blood glucose concentrations that affect fertility when we breed the cow at 60 to 90 days postpartum? And we, what the heck is going on there? You can see that out here when we're breeding the cow, the glucose concentrations are really quite similar. The same is true for U.S. cows. So this phenomenon that occurs in Irish dairy cows, it also occurs in U.S. cows. This is data from uh, Al Garfrick. And basically it's showing plasma glucose concentrations around the time of calving and early postpartum. Cows that get pregnant at first AI, cows that did not get pregnant at first AI. And you can see these early... Uh, Circulating glucose concentrations are predictive of whether or not the cow will become pregnant. So I got really interested in glucose and what's happening to glucose, particularly during the early postpartum period. And I've already stated that glucose is an interesting molecule for the ruminant, 
because it's, it's necessary to synthesize glucose, large quantities of glucose via gluconeogenesis. And of course, they synthesize uh, glucose from propionate, amino acids, and glycerol. But the other thing that's really interesting about glucose is, first of all, it's a big component of milk because of lactose. Okay, so a lot of glucose is used to synthesize milk. And secondly, uh, there's quite, the second thing about glucose that's interesting is the fact that it's controlling the endocrinology of the cow. So not only is it a key component of milk itself, it's also involved in controlling insulin and IGF-1 concentrations in the cow. So it's not only important for the synthesis of a substrate in milk, it's important for the endocrinology of the cow. And lastly, when we think about reproduction, and we think about rapidly dividing cells that are involved in reproduction, it's an important substrate for those rapidly dividing cells. Not so much for energy. Those cells don't use glucose for energy. Those cells use glucose for carbon skeleton to build cells with, okay? So it's not oxidative phosphorylation so much as just building cells and using glucose as a substrate for carbon to build cells. So it's an important molecule, and it, and it got my interest. So we have this hypothesis, and, and it has to do with the fact that we've got glucose here and lots of other things that are involved in the production of milk. The hormones associated with glucose are also involved in controlling endocrine axes involved in reproduction. That's the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. But they're also, these same hormones are also involved in controlling the sensitivity of follicles to gonadotropins, functionality and functionality of the corpus luteum. But add on top of that, that these same hormones and metabolites, again controlled in part by glucose, are involved in controlling the function of immune cells. And what's the other thing that's going on during this early postpartum period? We're dealing with periparturate immunosuppression. We're dealing with metritis, mastitis, pneumonia, all these things. And this key immune cell, the neutrophil, which we've already heard is involved in this, is potentially responding to this glucose, this environment created by low blood glucose. So that's why we're really interested in it. I'm not going to talk about... Uh, another aspect of this work, and that's later postpartum, whether or not glucose can control how fast the embryo develops. So I'm going to tell you about this study, and you can blame Dr. Wilbank for this study, because I proposed this hypothesis about three or four years in, in uh, Brazil, and <laughs> you don't remember this, Milo, but no, Milo stood in the back of the room and he said, that's all really nice. But where's the data, okay? And it really kind of made me mad, all right? So anyways, here we go, Milo. And, uh, you know, it, it forced me to go to Ireland. I spent a year in the rain and the cold, you know, dealing with cows that are this tall. And uh, because of Milo's comment. But it was, a, it was a fair comment. I didn't have any data. So here's the data. Okay. So in this experiment, this was done in Moore Park last year. We took, uh, we took, Postpartum cows, day seven postpartum, and we did uh, half the group that was infused with glucose at 750 grams per day. That was meant to approximate the deficiency based on the Overton data. And the other half of the group was infused with saline at, uh, at, at that dose. And we collected blood samples four times daily, and these infusions went on from day seven to 21 postpartum. So it's 14 days of infusion at this dose. These were not bolus infusions. These were with an infusion pump. The dose was spread out over a 24 hour period. So it was a constant rate of infusion, not a, just a big slug of glucose once a day or something like that. And it went on for, for 14 days. Cows were fed once daily in their morning, their total allotment of feed. We did this in a metabolism shed, and that's what the cows look like. So the question is, could we increase glucose with this treatment? And this is one of your quicker things, okay? So yes, you can, okay? So basically, you're going to see a lot of slides like this 
plasma glucose, this is the 14-day infusion period broken down into hour. A lot of times the data will look sort of bumpy like this, and that is because if you take blood samples four times daily in a cow, you can see these changes in hormones and metabolites associated with when you feed the cow, if you feed once daily in the morning. They were given their entire ration once daily. That doesn't mean by 12 o'clock in the afternoon they were out of feed. That just means they were given their entire ration once daily in the morning. And they, of course, really tuck into that in the morning. And then as the day goes on, they eat less and less. But anyways, regardless. So this is a typical type. Of, so we're infusing 750 grams per day. That is approximately one-third of their glucose requirement for milk production. And what you see is that, indeed, we can get the glucose up to about 70 mg per deciliter compared with the control saline infused, infused cows. The other thing I think you see, which is kind of interesting, is we're infusing quite a lot of glucose here relative to requirement, but the cows in the treated group, they never downregulate or decrease in terms of their own endogenous production. They don't appear to. They appear to sort of maintain that elevated blood glucose concentrations over time. And so we're infusing glucose into these, into these cows. And then the first question we had was, well, if we infuse glucose into this cow, postpartum cow, will that shut down her own gluconeogenic mechanisms? In other words, in response to this glucose infusion, will she just simply shut down gluconeogenesis? That's an obvious question. And so to answer that question, we took a, a liver sample before we did the bl blood sample, took a liver sample before we did the infusion, we did our experiment, and then we took our, a liver sample at the end, and we looked at the two key gluconeogenic enzymes that are supposed to be controlled by glucose. And when we increased the glucose supply to these cows, we did absolutely nothing in terms of Pepsi kit, PET-CK and glucose 6-phosphatase expression. In other words, these cows did not respond by turning off gluconeogenesis in response to our glucose infusion, which is interesting. I would have predicted they would stop making glucose in response to our dose of glucose, but they didn't do that. They carried, they carried, on, they carried on with the expression. So infused glucose... Um, even though we're infusing glucose, their own gluconeogenic mechanisms, which occur in the liver, are, are, are continuing. They did store that glucose. So we looked at glycogen content in the liver, either before or after the infusion. And you can see when we infused the glucose into these cows, they were one of the things they did with as glucose was they stored it as glycogen. My guess is that some of it went into the liver and a whole lot of it went into the muscle uh, during this infusion period. Okay, now we get into the interesting part of the story. And the interesting part of this story was an interaction of season by treatment. And so in Moore Park, we have, there's two herds of cows. There's an autumn herd and a spring herd. Okay, so autumn cows calve in the fall, Spring cows calve in the spring. Autumn cows are outdoors all summer as dry cows on grass. Spring cows are indoors in barns during the dry period. So the, the events leading up to their calving are very different, okay? And we are studying early postpartum cows. And one of the things I noticed in this data, the, the thing that really came through in this data were these seasonal effects of treatment, these treatment by season interactions. And so this interaction was only at the 10% level. But what we saw was, is when we infused glucose into the autumn cows, half of the cows were autumn, we didn't even move blood glucose concentrations. We infused 750 grams of glucose daily into these cows, and their blood glucose concentrations didn't move whatsoever. They were fully capable of taking that glucose and storing, or doing whatever with it. If we look at the spring cows, 
Infusing glucose into the spring cows elevated their blood glucose concentrations. Which, when I saw that, I said, oh my gosh, I said, we're dealing with two populations of cows. We're dealing with autumn cows that are essentially insulin sensitive, that was my prediction, and we're dealing with spring cows that are insulin resistant. This is classical insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? I infuse a dose of glucose and the body doesn't clear it. That's insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is I increase, infuse a dose of glucose, and despite elevated insulin release, I don't clear the glucose. Okay, so this is, these are data for insulin. We infused the same dose of glucose into these autumn cows. We didn't even move insulin whatsoever. We infused insulin into the spring cows, and you can see the large increases in insulin, excuse me, infused glucose into the spring cows, and you can see these large increases in insulin in response to that glucose infusion. And basically what that tells you is that these cows were different and the spring cows were, ins were, were insulin resistant, were infusing glucose, they're releasing insulin, but nonetheless they're failing to store that glucose. So that was interesting. Now, if there's an increase in insulin, as we saw in the, if there's an increase in insulin, as we saw in the spring cows, then we would predict that that would cause an increase in IGF-1 in the bloodstream. And indeed, what we saw is that in the cows, if we look at liver IGF-1 messenger RNA, for the cows and the calves in the fall, the fall group, we didn't move liver IGF-1 messenger RNA at all. But those cows that were insulin resistant, we were, we were able to increase insulin concentrations with our infusion. We certainly did move IGF-1 concentrations. And then if we look at the actual circulating IGF-1 concentrations in the bloodstream, for the fall calving cows, infusing glucose didn't do anything to circulating IGF-1 concentration. But in those insulin resistant cows in the spring, uh, we definitely moved the IGF-1 concentrations upward. So what this taught me is a lot of the things we understand about sort of postpartum cows in the United States and a lot of the things we talk about, increasing insulin, increasing IGF-1, this is all really a function of having a cow in an insulin-resistant state. And not all cows are in insulin-resistant states, and if they're not in insulin-resistant states, the biology isn't exactly uh, the same. I think that's what I learned from, from this part of the study. All right, let's talk about NEFAs. So one of the things you see when you infuse glucose is you can depress the release of non-esterified fatty acids. Okay, so this is the same data. This is blood NEFA concentrations during the 14-day infusion. You can see saline infused animals here and you can see the glucose infused animals right there. And these changes that you're seeing, those are normal biological changes that occur throughout the day with highest NEFA occurring at six o'clock in the morning. So you can, right before we fed them. So you can see that if we do this infusion, glucose will decrease NEFAs. Glucose infusion will decrease the amount of triglyceride in the liver. So when we infuse the glucose, what you see is this is a liver sample taken before the infusion. This is a liver sample taken after the infusion. If we infuse glucose into these cows, you can see they have lesser liver triglyceride percentage compared with the saline infused cows. But again, if we go back to this concept of having one group of cows that's insulin resistant and another group of cows that's not insulin resistant, what you see is that these fall cows, which were insulin sensitive, we can see were very successful at reducing NEFAs, but in the spring cows that were insulin resistant, were not able to reduce the NEFA concentrations to the same extent. Now, 
BHBAs are actually different. When we talk about ketones, those are actually uh, quite different. And as much as regardless of whether it was a fall cow or a spring cow, we could reduce uh, blood ketone concentrations with the glucose infusion. And so what that really means is when we think about our model for what's going on in the postpartum cow, this, this release of NEFA from adipose tissue that's actually an insulin sensitive uh, event. That depends on insulin sensitivity. And so in those spring cows that were not sensitive to insulin, we were not able to block this event. But in the fall cows that were sensitive to insulin, we could successfully decrease NEFAS. And when we talk about BHBA, how come we could reduce BHBA with glucose in both groups. And that's because the glucose transport in the liver is not dependent on a glucose sensitive transporter, okay? The, the liver uses uh, GLUT2. Glu it's not an insulin dependent process to get glucose into the liver. And when we infuse glucose into a cow that has elevated ketones, that basically provides TCA intermediates to uh, suck up the ketone bodies. And so regardless of the insulin status of these cows, infusing glucose will decrease BHBA, and it really doesn't depend on their insulin sensitivity. So what we showed, at least for the first half of this study, was that if we infuse glucose uh, into these cows, we can really move the other things like insulin and IGF-1 and NEFAs and BHBAs, we can move them around quite a bit. And it doesn't have to be, a, a, it can be a physiological dose of glucose given in a physiologically relevant manner. So the next question we had and the real reason we wanted to do this study is, if we move this cow around metabolically in this manner, does it have any effect whatsoever on all these other things, including reproduction and neutrophil function and that sort of thing? And the rest of this story kind of reads like this quote from uh, Thomas Huxley, who's the grandfather of Sue Andrew Huxley, the very famous physiology. So the rest of the story kind of reads like this quote. It's like, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact, okay? And uh, that's what I really felt as I did this experiment, you know, all this stuff on glucose, and then you have to do the experiment. So the first question is, okay, let's look at feed intake. Does it, does, we gave them all this glucose, does it regulate feed intake, how much they eat? No effect. No effect on how much they ate in the barn. None. Zip. Zero. Does it, does it, as Rick told us yesterday, does it drive milk production by driving lactose synthesis? Well, I gave them all this glucose, theoretically, so they could use it for lactose. No effect whatsoever on milk production in the barn. Okay, nothing. Zero. And I should mention, I forgot to mention, but those insulin sensitive and those autumn and fall cows, they produced almost the exact same amount of milk almost in the barn, inside the barn. The one thing, so this is kind of really, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna set myself up, but I gotta do better than Milo. I mean, this might relate to Clicker, okay? Uh, uh, Milo and I are very competitive, all right? So anyways, okay. But the one thing that was interesting, and this needs to be followed up on, the one thing that was interesting, and this is milk production for the first, uh, I just pulled out the first 84 days. You can see this is milk production. Now this is all the cows put together. During the infusion period, we really didn't do anything to milk production based on the glucose. But subsequently, after the infusion period had, had ended and the cows had gone out into the fields, you can see that there, it's highly significant. There appeared to be a carryover effect of this treatment on subsequent milk production. And you can see that the cows that we infused with glucose in the barn subsequently had greater uh, peak milk production during lactation. 
And it's a little bit reminiscent of what Nidum says, right? Daryl Nidum says, you know, if we don't treat ketosis, we're going to have this much loss in milk production all across the entire lactation. And you start to wonder whether or not there is something going on here early that, that can impact the long-term capacity of the cow to make milk. I mean, it's interesting. Okay. So let's go on to reproduction. Okay, so we infused glucose. We made the cow very happy with all these infusions. Did we do anything to interval the first ovulation? Well, here's interval the first ovulation for the, for the cows treated with glucose. Here's interval the first ovulation with the cows treated with saline. Okay, did not impact interval the first ovulation with this treatment. Uh, however, if we look at those cows that were from the fall herd that were insulin sensitive, they had a, in the barn, 64% of them ovulated first wave dominant follicle compared with the cows that were insulin insensitive in the spring, 27%. So probably not significant, but it's interesting the cows that were insulin insensitive in the spring were delayed in terms of their ov ovulation. Okay, so the last thing I'll talk about is, I think, is, yeah, are these neutrophils. And we're really interested in neutrophils, again, because these are the guys that are involved with dealing with mastitis. They're involved in dealing with metritis. They're involved in dealing with pneumonia. And the better and more healthy they are, the better. So we did a series of functional tests on the neutrophils. Most of the literature will say that elevated IGF-1 Elevated, uh, elevated IGF-1, elevated insulin, elevated glucose, low NEFA, and low BHBA make neutrophils really happy. And so we hoped with this model that we would make neutrophils really happy. That's what we were trying to do. So in this experiment, again, great theories in science need to be tested. And so in this experiment, we isolated neutrophils before we did, from blood, before we did the infusions, we started the infusions, we isolated them after seven days of infusion, 14 days of infusion, and then after the cows went off the infusions, we isolated neutrophils again and assessed their functionality. And so to do this, we isolated neutrophils on percol gradient, we took neutrophils from the bloodstream and isolated them and tested them for their functionality during using a variety of tests, CD62L expression, oxidative burst, phagocytosis, and looked at their glycogen pro, uh, content as, as well. Okay, so essentially the, what this experiment entailed was getting the neutrophils out of their cow, assess, cows, assessing their function uh, via flow cytometry in a, a series of tests, and these are just flow cytometry data for CD62L expression from this experiment. And no effect of treatment whatsoever. The glucose did nothing at all in terms of changing the ability of these neutrophils to function. The one thing that was highly, highly significant is whether or not that neutrophil came out of a cow that calved in the fall or calved in the spring. That's what was highly significant, these seasonal effects. And so you can see that if we look here, this is CD260L expression, which is, uh, which is involved in the rolling. You can see, first of all, improvement of CD62L expression, which was talked about earlier by Dr. Curley over time. But you can see that these fall calving cows are uh, improving at a much faster rate than the spring calving cows. If we look at oxidative burst activity, uh, which is killing activity, you can see cows that calved in the fall are improving to a greater extent during this postpartum period compared to cows that are calved in the spring, which are definitely not improving in terms of their, CD, in terms of their oxidative burst activity. And finally, if we look at glycogen content, neutrophils use glycogen for energy to do their thing, uh, 
what we saw is the glycogen content for those cows, for neutrophils, for those cows calving in the fall was actually superior than the glycogen content for those cows calving in the spring. So what I came away from this study, and this is our nearly the last slide besides the clicker question, is this. It's pretty clear that this early postpartum glucose is, uh, I think it's pretty important to this very early postpartum period. And I think these differences are real, but I don't think this has anything to do with what happened to the cow after calving or around the time of calving. I think basically what I think is that all this early postpartum stuff is set up either, I don't know what the day is, but weeks or months before that cow calves. And by the time she calves, essentially the train has already left the station. The train has already left the station in terms of immune function. The train has already left the station in terms of how much glycogen she's got stored in those immune cells or stored in that muscle. And then coming into this very early postpartum period and simply trying to increase glucose supply in a very acute manner can't do anything to that train that's already left the station. It might have implications for long-term health of the cow, as we saw in terms of that milk production, but this very early thing is, 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 not, is not doable. So what we started to focus on is ask the, ask the question, okay, why? And then try to figure out, okay, why are these, is one group of cows insulin sensitive? Why is another group of cows not insulin sensitive? And is there something we can do to that dry cow to recreate this cow who maintains insulin sensitivity and sort of superior immune function uh, during this uh, early postpartum period?